a good opportunity. But I'm missing part of ballet song. You miss you miss a lot of stuff. You're supposed to say you're missing AP US history. You gotta learn a lot about politics. What are you missing? Ballet and US history. There you go. There you go. No, I, I think that's fine. Right but in this room, it's got to be a the U.S. history. No. Why? Because? Because it's cool. Very good. <laughs> when it's too many days, it just seems like there's <coughs> so many so many ways that we try to get kids out of class, you get students out of class. Right. Okay. Like, <laughs> or like, I think it really works that way. I like to think it works that way, but if you don't have background, you're just an observer. We could just go to like some cool But what happens is there's always things that pull people out of, out of class. And then we turn around and say, but we want you to do well in class. But what message are you telling the students if you're always looking for ways to get them out of class? That it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So it actually is corrosive. Because we're still living in the And we're living in the That's so much for me. It's a lot. Last year. And let's say in this class, it's what I say in class. What we go in class. Yeah. And then I'm going to be gone all next week. Um, who's your son? Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Is he really Mrs. Sanders? Yes. Okay. Mr. Sanders was one of the boys, a good friend of mine, but he's a great teacher. He retired a couple years ago, so he might have him. No, no, he was gone. And he's been gone. We should have for a while. We should have for a while. No, Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders can teach stuff. So. So basically, that is. All right, let's go take your notes out. Let's talk homework. Would you like some homework? Two things of homework. That packet with the fornication laws and the Revolutionary War. There's uh, no. Oh, we never finished this question. Yeah, there's still some read and there's some reading documents on there too. Reading documents, some documents on. There. So the fornication laws, and then it has the worksheets, the video. But turn to the second to last page. We're going to get to the second to last page, and it's there are two short documents on there. The first one I shape the that's it, the late rebellion. I do want you to just read that. But the second one, the tree of liberty must be refreshed with the blood of patriots. Read the tree of liberty, and you guys, you have to do read it. And then give me the purpose. Why I wrote it, you know, you have to give a little purpose, and with that purpose, a little bit of content. But the big thing is the purpose. And then read both of them, but just do the purpose for the three of them. Then you turn the page. There's another one, it's, it's Federalist number 10. It's, a, it's an excerpt from that. Please read this, and you have to answer questions three or four at the bottom of the page. So you have three things on that piece of paper. Three three no, three and four. Oh, three and four. And so you turn in one paper with the purpose of the tree of liberty, and then three and four. And one thing when you read, yeah, do it on the same page, just as long as I know which is which. And Federalist Number Ten was propaganda to get the Constitution ratified. Specifically, New York to get it out, and so it's written by James Madison, who's considered the father of the Constitution. He wants the Constitution to be ratified, so he's trying. What he's writing down are what he thinks are positives that this new government will create. So he's saying he'll go through some different examples of different types of government, and then try and say, "But this is why we need the Constitution. This will do it." So don't forget that it's propaganda. It's not necessarily true, and it's misleading, and it might not happen the way he thought it would. But that's what he thought. All right, new heading, new unit. The founding of the republic. Yep, this is our second unit. Founding the Republic, nice job erasing the board. You two have a gift. Oh, yeah, that was a little And then you supervise. And they erased it maybe one minute. And this is approximately 1783 to 1824. And so we're basically talking about the beginnings of the country, the new form of government's going to create, and then 
uh, Jefferson and, and basically the roots right before it became what we would consider to be a democracy. Is that a summer or a two? Two. The AP, the College Board divides us up into units, and this is their, the unit they're in in 1754 to 1800 and 1800 to 1848. And I combine those two, or that'd be two huge units. So I, I, I'm trying to make it a little bit easier to kind of digest it all. In reality, I think these fit together better. So that's periodization. There, there's my imitation of your sound. And so what we're talking about here, we're going to begin the first form of government for the United States, a brief explanation of the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation. Nope, just counting. And Articles of Confederation, the Second Continental Congress approved it in 1781, but it really didn't become a form of government until 1783 because that's what the treaty would write on. The Treaty of Paris in 1783. And the British were leaving New York. And it kind of fit in with the wartime experience of the new United States. And the big thing was they feared centralized government. They feared the power in the hands of one person or one entity. That's what they feared. And so they, every state was different, but they tried to have, for example, most states had national or their state assemblies, and they had they choose them every year. The governor would have a one-year term. They try to get as many people as power in, in office as possible, so there wouldn't be one entity, one tyrant. Because of the whole thing about King George and that war, um, that experience. And therefore, there is going to be. They wanted limited democracy. <coughs> Now, nobody wanted a democracy, and there's never really been a democracy. The United States is by no means a democracy today. Because in a democracy, that means the people decide everything. It's majority rule for every decision. And for lots of reasons, as you will see in Federalist Number 10, he talks about it, it's really unwieldy. But not only that, they don't want the mob deciding things. And so there was a limited idea that the people had power. And that's what the democracy in this context is but not full power. So it's limited democracy. The elite fear democracy, and every state had different rules for voting. Some states, you had to have a lot of property. Some states, not as much property, but still basically only white men. And so the Articles government, then, the Confederation, it is also called. Sometimes you hear it called the Confederacy. Actually, they called it the Confederacy most of the time then. That might get confusing with the Confederacy in 1861. But they made it in this idea, no central government, no tyrant, spread out the power as much as possible. And so some of the characteristics of this did that, but almost ended the country, because it did not work at all. So basically, the power would be in the states. The states would have power in this new confederation congress. So instead of one entity unit, 13, power decentralized. Next, each state gets one vote. It's actually kind of funny. So it's in Philadelphia and New York where there'd be the Confederation Congress. And states could send as many representatives as they wanted, but they only get one vote. So there's going to be a ton of representatives from Pennsylvania when it's in Philadelphia, yet they only get one vote. So they can shout out everybody else. But the one person who came from Georgia was equal. One state, one vote. Big states hated this, big by population, because their goal, Virginia, is the same as Rhode Island, for example. Small states love this. There's a vestige of this that still remains in the United States today that was written into the new constitution as part of our <coughs> compromise. Now, when I mean the new constitution, I mean the new constitution in 1787. But in what body? Does the, do the states have equal votes? No matter the size, everyone gets a say. The Senate. 
two votes. Two members of the Senate from each state, the House by population. So Montana, with a small population, we have one. California, one. 53. So states one vote. Next, to pass a law, nine votes to pass a law. They wanted a super majority, and so more than just seven states. The idea being is that there wouldn't be radical change. So if something big and emotional happened, they wouldn't immediately start passing laws, just or taking advantage of the of the passions of the people to pass laws. They must have a super majority. But the problem is nothing's going to pass. So you can get the New England states basically to vote down anything, or the southern states to vote down anything, nothing happens. If governments cannot adapt and change to changing circumstances, they become weak and effective, don't really work. We have a little bit of that problem today in the United States. 13 votes to change it, also called to amend it. So every state has to agree, meaning nothing changes. And so built into the system, is or are flaws that are going to destroy this but not just that they didn't want the tyrant so no executive executive and the executive has two really big functions the first one is the executive does foreign policy who's the executive of the united states today hmm. president obama was the executive of the state They're the person who, okay, foreign policy, technically, for the state, he deals with the federal government. But the president deals with foreign policy. There's no voice for foreign policy. John Adams was the ambassador to Britain, and it drove him crazy because he's all alone. And since Britain knew that this weak government couldn't do anything, they didn't care. Jefferson was in Paris. He's the ambassador to Paris, to France. He had no power. Even though he kind of strutted around because he was, he was a major celebrity, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Look what I did, kind of thing. But here's the big thing that the executive does, and this is why they don't have one. The executive interprets and they carry out laws. They interpret and carry out laws. And so the president is the one who gets the laws from Congress, well, the executive branch, and they go through it, and then they decide how to enforce it. That is almost unlimited power. That is why they didn't want one, because that means that one person and therefore one entity around them can do so much. Now, there are limits to the power, but still, what immense power. They didn't want that to happen. Who would do this? Well, foreign policy would be done by the Congress or the Confederation. Interpreting and carrying out laws would be done by the states. So the states, ideal, the, ideal, um, the ideal system was the states get the law, then it was, okay, this is how we enforce it for Rhode Island. This is how we enforce it for South Carolina, et cetera. But I think you could probably imagine what happened if a state didn't like the law. They said, eh, we're not going to do it. And there's nothing that the national government can do. Nothing. They don't have an executive to do that. You know, Congress can pass another law, but big deal. Next, no federal court system. <coughs> they thought the states could handle this again. But then how do you deal with a lawsuit from, let's say, somebody in New York against somebody in Connecticut? Or for that matter, someone in Connecticut and someone from Britain. Or where do you take appeals? There is no system, there is no overall, all, overall system to decide ultimately what the law is. So you can have 13 different interpretations of the law. Next. They had no real power to regulate commerce. <coughs> Technically, they could do it, but they couldn't because they couldn't get any laws passed, and there was no executive to deal with foreign um, with foreign trade. So international trade unregulated. 
And so every state had their own rules. The one that really got it is not just international trade, but was interstate commerce, commerce between the states. States began to charge tariffs on each other. That's interstate. This is just a scribbled outline. States begin to charge tariffs, a tax on imports. And so states are charging tariff on a um, New York, we charge tariff on shoes coming from Connecticut. And so on and so on. And literally, the states have trade wars. For example, New York City, they have a lot of cobblers. What does a cobbler do? Yeah, they make shoes. A skilled position, but someone not my just. I'm dreaming. Cobblers make shoes. But what's happening was they're being undercut by British shoes. Britain is just beginning the Industrial Revolution. They can make certain parts of the shoes much, much faster. And so British shoes were half as much as New York shoes. So what did New York do? New York put a tariff on British shoes. So they drove British shoes out by putting this really high tax on them. So cobblers within New York would be protected, so to speak. In fact, they could even raise their price a little bit. But Connecticut didn't. So Connecticut allowed in British shoes. It's actually called a dump. Britain, they allowed Britain to dump shoes into the Connecticut market, dropping the price of shoes. But what happened? Then they bought shoes in Connecticut really cheap and brought them to New York undercutting the cobblers there. So what did New York do? New York put a tariff on Connecticut. Tar Connecticut put a tariff on New York. Then New York closed their border. Connecticut closed their border, and the next thing you know, militia from Connecticut are fighting militia from New York. They started shooting each other. For five months, they went to an undeclared war. New York must have had really big troubles, because it's same thing happened with them in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. New York must have become a nasty state. New Jersey and Pennsylvania also had a little bit of a shoot match over trade. And what could the national government do? Cut it out, you guys. Quit. They couldn't do anything. And so, big problem here. Next, no army or navy. What they thought the states would provide militia. But there's no way to force the states to do it. And so this legacy is going to go on to the War of 1812. Even though there's now a federal government, the British defeated American forces right here, the Battle of Niagara, and the New York militia sat on a hill and watched the US Army get beaten. Because their governor said we don't want to fight this war. So same thing would happen in North Carolina during the Civil War. Send troops. By the way, what do you call that? When I'm taking something from this era and relating it to another era. What is that called? Hmm? Contextualization. That's actually, I'm, I'm kind of compared to what's happening at that moment. Am I going to throw the pin at everybody to so remember that word? It's like Periodization. Close. Periodization means stuff that happens in the big, broader period. But let's say go outside of it. Huh? Synthesis. This is synthesis. And if you don't know, you got to know synthesis. Because I relate to things all the time. And sometimes, and then soon we'll do assignments where you have to synthesize, especially when you start getting more units. That's synthesis. But no army or navy. Here's the big thing there's no executive, no way to regulate trade or anything like that and no way to enforce it, this led to a disaster. The Treaty of Paris, of 1783, all the things in this treaty, the US could not enforce. Loyalists were supposed to be able to get their land back. Well, the states just ignored that. They never got their land back. The Mississippi River and New Orleans were supposed to be open to commerce. Nope. Spain charged tolls all the time. Britain never left here. Spain did not enforce their border here. 
slaves were running away and going to Spanish Florida. The United States wanted them to stop this. Spain, no, what are you going to do about it? I'm not saying they should have returned the slaves. I'm going to take a big stand here. Slavery bad. But that was happening. So a number of things they couldn't enforce this treaty. If you can't even enforce the most basic elements of a treaty that guaranteed your independence, how long can the country last? How long can you last as a nation? And so this is big. Next. They had no real power to tax. Technically, they had the power to get the states to give them money, but the states refused to do it. And they had some limited power to tax, but they could never get it passed. So basically, they couldn't tax. If you can't tax, you can't have money. You can't run government. You can't protect markets. Governments cannot function. Societies cannot function. Because their economic issues were huge. They did not have the power to control the money supply. They could not control the money supply. If a government cannot control the money supply, that means that markets cannot function. That means business cannot function. Period. Governments are necessary. They create the market. For lots of ways they create the market that supply and demand happens in an economy, but they do it the biggest ways by controlling the currency. There was no set currency. None. The Confederation Congress could print money. States could print money. Cities could print money. We could print money. But not only that, there's still continental currency from the Revolutionary War floating around in the mid 1780s. There's still colonial currency. There's still British pounds, uh, British colonial dollars, Spanish colonial dollars, Spanish pesos, French flank, francs, and francs. You see the problem? Everything's on there. Everything. So nobody knows what a value of money is. And the thing about it is this. If you don't know what the value of the money supply is going to be tomorrow, if you don't know what, whatever kind of money you're using or accepting, it's going to be worth tomorrow, today you hoard it. Today you sit on it because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So there's no business activity. Merchants can't plan for the future. Why would anybody make investment for the future if they their money might be worthless tomorrow. Markets cannot function unless there's a strong government to guarantee the value of money. They do other things too, like you know, make sure that um, if you do have a, or do involved in the market, let's say you're a merchant, and somebody just doesn't walk in and take all your stuff. Markets can't function if you think you're not protected and safe. All those things require government doesn't exist. So let's get back to um, confederation dollars. Confederation dollars was confederation currency. Nobody trusted the confederation currency. So they needed something to back it up. This is what we call the gold standard. What they say is basically, we promise this, this piece of paper is worth this much. <coughs> but here's the issue. If you have no power tax, what is no power tax? I just realized it's no power to tax. It's no power tax. You can't, you can't tax power. Don't even try it. If you don't have the power to tax, if a government does not have the power to tax, then they have nothing to prove that the currency is going to be worth it. Nothing. The only way money is worth anything is if government has power to tax. Period. So put a line there, connect it, because that's a key element. The reason why the United States dollar is worth something is because we can tax, and people believe we can tax. We what we say is worth that. Because basically, all currency is is little pieces of debt. We promise that you'll be you'll get something that's worth a dollar. We promise you. But if you can't tax, then what's the currency going to be worth? What's going to happen to the currency? Yeah. If, hmm? Yeah, it'll go down in value. What do we call that where the money goes down in value? Prices do what? Inflate. That's inflation. And so what do you have? Inflation. Huge inflation. In some areas, then deflation. 
there you get a lot more stuff for a a piece of British or a, a British pound sterling, a coin, than you would for currency. Well, then how do you run a business? We have all these different forms of money floating around. It was just it was just chaos, and so didn't work. Here's synthesis again. Ooh, exciting, huh? So countries that can't tax, they have massive inflation. Zimbabwe had a thousand percent inflation every day in the early 2000s because they couldn't tax. They just had no money. No one trusted that the money's worth anything. And can you imagine prices going up a thousand percent every day? Think if you had a savings account, what happened to the money in your savings? Do you remember what happened in 1923? Hmm? Germany. They had higher inflation because they couldn't tax. They couldn't tax. And so that's why now Germany is like crazy scared of inflation because of that. That's big. And so they couldn't control the economy. It was a disastrous situation. And with that, then the Continental or the Confederation Congress. Was ineffective. I went through a lot. I mean, there's more things we can go through, but those are the big. And there's only going to be two big laws by the Confederation Congress that passed that would still be enforced after the government was changed and it's still enforced to this day. Two laws, two big successes. That's it. The first one is the Land Ordinance of 1785. Ordinance is just another term for a law. And what the ordinance did was, the thing was, the U.S. had all this land in the West. If you look at it on, that map isn't very good to show it. Here, all the areas that got orange or brown, all this now is part of the U.S., technically owned by the United States government. And the U.S. wanted to make it available all this land for people to move in. So the US can really hold on to its claim. There was a real fear that somebody else would sweep this up. Britain, Spain, France might come back. So they needed Americans living there. That's why the Mississippi River was so important for trade. So they had to figure out a way. But first thing you gotta do before you do that, you have to survey it. You have to measure it out so you can divvy it out. So the land ordinance would deal with this land in the West by setting up a system to survey territory. So one of the first things the United States did to prove ownership is they went out and they measured it. They set up a system and they did it in a very organized way that didn't happen to 13 colonies because it's very haphazard. They set up a grid system and they basically gridded the entire United States. Every place that was not owned by somebody else or had some kind of weird beginning the Mexican session was a little bit weird, for example, because it got it from Mexico, Texas, because it was an independent country for 10 years. So it's different. And then like Montana, you can see a grid pattern in the east. When we get to the mountains, it gets harder because of more rivers, and they so you get like half grid and half not. But if you ever seen an ownership land of almost every place in the US outside of 13 territory, 13 colonies in Texas, it's like a checkerboard. The whole thing's a checkerboard because they gridded it. And so just imagine they just gridded latitude and longitude lines, measured it all out. It would be much more square than this. But each one of these, they'd make a six mile by six mile township. So they would divvy it up into townships. So now you have the large unit to measure everything. And then from there, they would divide each of these six by six, six miles by six miles. So each township would have 36 one mile by one mile square sections. Idealized. If there's a river, it changes it. You know, mountains, it would might be a half a township. But that is the idealized version. And then you can sell the sections. You sell a whole section, 640 acres. Or down to a quarter section, which is 160 acres. So they can divvy it up and sell it. And how much, how big 
they allow for sale, how much of the section they allow to sell really tells you a lot. If they only sell by section, that means basically not many people are going to move in, so you're pretty rich speculators. If they divvy it up in a quarter section, 160 acres, they want more people. And that's how they divided it up by sections. And we'll get to this a little bit later on, but the, the money from one section. This was also in the Enabling Act, would go towards education. It was unclear the Enabling Act of 1803 would confirm it, but the idea is that the United States, money from that would have a role in education. And so that is a way to bring money in. The United States government might have trouble taxing, but the sale of land will bring in a lot of money. Also, the states must give up land claims. And this was one of the most controversial things. Virginia claimed all the land to the Pacific Ocean. New Jersey had a claim to the Great Lakes. New York claimed all of this to the continental divide. They all had to give up these claims. Basically, they got a little bit of debt forgiveness, and that bill was successful. The other one, in a way, has a more long-term impact. We should really see what's going to happen. It's called the Northwest Ordinance. Of 1787. Technically, it's the Land Ordinance of 1787. Everybody calls it the Northwest Ordinance. And I know this might sound weird, but that's the Northwest. The new United States. And this is going to be called the Northwest for a very long time. Well, or at least to the end of the 19th century, 1800s. All the way through, that's the Northwest is Wisconsin. But it did a couple things. First off, the Northwest Ordinance said, okay, now that we are surveying the land, we need some kind of government. So it set up the system for where an area would become a territory and then a state. When it got 6,000 males, they can become a territory. The territory, the government, is still run for the federal government. But once it got 60,000, they can become a state. You know, if I said males, males were the citizens. And this little flaw about males being citizens by law is the reason why today women are not guaranteed equal rights under the Constitution. Because women were not. It's complex, but we're not the same kind of citizens. So women do not have equal rights in the U.S. We'll get to this 14th Amendment after the Civil War. But it said this, and all these states will be equal. And so any new state, so Michigan or Kentucky or Montana, will be equal as the original 13 colonies. Actually, it wasn't clear if it would apply to areas on the other side of the Mississippi River when the U.S. would acquire the claim, but for sure here. Now, Montana then would go through this. It'd be part of a large territory, it'd be part of Dakota territory, actually Missouri territory, Dakota territory. But eventually, what year would Montana become a territory? Here we get this step. What year? Got statehood. Way before that, actually. 1864 during the Civil War. It could become a state earlier, but this was a time we had there were um, Republican presidents, and they thought Montana would send two Democratic senators, so they delayed it a long time. But that's not the big, well, that's only one big part of the law. The other one is we have to give a little bit of background. So we got all this area, all this. It's not part of the U.S. And so they had to figure out, okay, we're going to allow them to become states. How do we set these up? A year before this, back in 1786, there was a law that it would create nine states, new states. So set up the apparatus. There will be nine states. But here's the biggie. Using the terminology that would become commonplace, they would be 
free states. What does free state mean? They started saying more and more by the 19th century, everybody, everybody would have known if you said this is a free state. What does that mean? Does it have something? Slavery. It doesn't mean the land is free, but it's just no slavery. It's more complex than simply saying no slavery. They wouldn't have slave codes. So you didn't have the apparatus to have slavery. But they'd be free. No, this was actually Thomas Jefferson's idea. Jefferson was hoping to stop the spread of slavery, so hopefully slavery will go away after he's dead. I mean, he wants to keep his stuff now. It got eight votes. Eight votes. Our entire course of history would be different if that would pass. I don't know how. Montana would be allied with Bulgaria right now and control the world. That'd be my guess. That's just guess. <laughs> Little Bulgaria would be known as. What states did vote for? One, two, three, four, five. Those had the little music stand. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So, nah. so the Northwest Ordinance is a compromise. And what did it say? Five states north of the Ohio would be free. It didn't actually have any idea what states it would be. It basically just said, we're going to have five states here. And no, it did not bother to ask the people who live there, hey, you're going to be a state. Sound good? No, they never, you know, this is, we're going to have five states. But if the five states north of the Ohio River are going to be free, what does it imply? What does it infer about any state's credit below it? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, even though it didn't say it in the law, it legally set up something that will divide the country bitterly, and the divide you still see to this day. We call it sectionalism. The divide over slavery. North and South. Now, there's already going to be big differences, but this set it up. In fact, Besides in the Civil War, Ohio River is basically the boundary. By law, we have sectionalism. And government will continue to perpetuate sectionalism as a compromise to keep the country together. The point is, they already knew back then that slavery might tear everything apart. And it came literally within a whiskers, uh, whisker of doing it. Okay, so those are the two ones that survived. But in reality, they knew there was big trouble. Big trouble. In 1785, some people met secretly at Mount Vernon. Who lived in Mount Vernon? Yeah, George Washington's home. Washington, who gave up power after the war, just still just an incredible thing. They were all coming into Washington saying, you got to do something. We need a stronger government. In fact, some were saying, be a dictator. We'll back you up. Be a king. We need a stronger government. These are mostly the elite. Well, no, not mostly. These are the elite. 1786, same thing in Annapolis. Annapolis, Maryland. A bigger conference, a little more open with, to strengthen the articles. So you already have this happening. And then in 1787, all hell broke loose. Shays' Rebellion. All the problems of the Confederation Congress seem to happen at one time. The money supply issue, the economic issue, and what do you do if there's internal insurrection? The government had no power. It nearly spread. It would be this, Shay's Rebellion, that would lead directly to the Constitution. The need for a strong central government. And this is another class. This is a class conflict. So once again, synthesis, what rebellion, we've already talked about, is this a little like? Look, yeah, what did you say? A little bit like Boston Massacre, but and the big one. So Boston Massacre works. Bacon's the biggest one, but they both work. That's good. I, I was even thinking Boston Massacre, but it fits right in. 
and very much like this. And it happened in Massachusetts. Once again in Massachusetts, in Mass. And the issue was this. The fight, well, I'll back, um, let me explain the issue. Massachusetts had very strict property requirements. For the term for the vote is suffrage. They had very strict property requirements. You had to have a lot of property in Massachusetts to vote. What it meant is the vast majority of people in Massachusetts, men or women, could not vote. So the assembly and the government were chosen by this tiny group of people. Kind of interesting how the, the uh, revolution that started because of no taxation or representation in Boston, then they would have a government that basically didn't allow representation of most people. The founding fathers that said, we want representation for us. It's not the riffraff. Well, what that meant is the elite are in charge. And what the elite did is the elite, they wanted, or let me just, they printed very little currency. Oh, shoot, that's what we want with that. Okay, I'll pay you tomorrow. Quick quiz, it'll be pretty basic. Uh, hand back the test. Emily, you did this in pencil. I can't accept this. I'm kidding. No. But starting after Christmas, you have to write everything in pen. Yeah. Yeah, just over chapter six. I, I signed after the test. I, I signed oh, okay. 254 to 267, I think. Yeah, since we do the AP exam in pen, we got used to writing in pen. Hmm? Yes, please. But I'm not kidding. Pen, if the only one make, don't make a lot of mistakes, it's easier to write with. You don't have to press as hard. Is it next week you're gone? Yeah, next week I'm off. For some reason, I thought it was this week.